But uh, comparing this to get that close to the camera, not sitting there. See the pores of his skin. <laughs> um, so we're at this. Or at, um, so um, there's the narrator, John, and Jesus. And I think that's basically it for Revelation. There's a couple of endings, but we don't reach that, I don't think, until. Um, so, what do you guys know about uh, Revelation? Came to John when he was exiled, mm -hmm. and they came to him. I think while he was even even in exile and even in the penal colony type you know, work order, he still had the day to you know one day to spend just with God. It was all in the day. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So as I said, one day. Uh, it is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day with the Lord. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, heavenly time. So, um, any other thoughts about Revelation? Do you know why I switched to Revelation? No. no. Well, um, I've been doing research. Um, I'm in all sorts of books, you know. Um, so I want to continue Exodus, but we started it, and we didn't have the background knowledge. Um, we do now. We have basically and the setup of Israel and the, everything we need. And the setup of sacrifice, we just got done doing that. The only thing that we haven't touched on is um, when they actually get into Israel, a lot of these things have to do with the actual land and location of Israel. But we talked about it being the promised land. So if we can just assume that they're in Israel. And um, this is post-Christ, so they've been exiled again. Um, scattered abroad, and this this is a, a dream. Um, and now there's three Johns, right? There's um, there's like there's the Apostle John, the beloved John, who's different. They're all the same one. They're all the same I one. Gonna, I, I was going to ask if we think yeah. of the first act, what we knew about. Is it the same John. The same John. John. Right now, In fact, when. He's one of the lost ones remaining because it, when they said that, um, he was totally telling Peter what kind of death he was going to have for him to glorify him. They said, well, what about him? They pointed to John and said, if I want him to, uh, to linger right. and I come back, what's up to you? You follow me. <laughs> and he, it, was a, it was a jest because he died in custody. So, and that's the thing is, he was, John, was uh, both the beloved, and he was also one of the th sons of thunder, and he was also, I mean, he was a fisherman, and then he ended up with, he was basically known, I think, and from what I had perceived as being like the best friend of Christ, um, him and James and Peter, mm -hmm. um, when I thought it was a great thing, but then that's another story. Um, so now he was... Um, he had just he had taken time away from the constant work he was being forced to do, and had the time to just be in the spirit of the Lord, and it literally was translated into that. Um, that amazes me. Um, there is a song on the the Hebrewic song. Hebrewic song, anyway, it was called. Enter the, enter the Holy of Holies, and a, a video showing John. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And it was, it just. Paul Whitmer. I think so. He's the target. Yeah. That's a given. It just shows a video of a guy like being thrown around in the spirit into God's, into God's throne room, back out. And he looked tired and beraggled in the video, but. You know, it's being with the Lord is refreshing in the spirit. So, so in this book, so I guess we could start with one, um, and then uh, I'll be the narrator. Pretty short. Does anybody want to be John? 
Okay. Moving down. Yeah. And do we want to take? Do you guys want to break up Christ? Like paragraph, paragraph, read it, or does anybody want to take up the long? Yeah. Pretty much just go to chapter two and three. Well, let's do. Does somebody want to take Jesus for chapter one? Okay. You Jesus. Okay. So. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show, oh, this, is, this is Revelation 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Um, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of his prophecy, and blessed are the words of his prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is There's another thing I forgot to mention. Um, dream. This is a dream and a vision. Um, and so in the theological seminary, in seminary, they did theology of dreams and visions and stuff. And the key to interpreting dreams and visions is not the details of it, but it's the emotion behind it. And so just like when you awake from a dream, you have a feeling afterwards, and it's really strong, and it changed how you walk out the rest of your day. Um, for example, I had a dream, I was leaving Raquel and the kids in worship, and that shit kind of changed my heart. I was like, oh, yeah, it's just worship. You know, the spirit's there. And so that feeling stuck with me long after the details, like, what was the room we were in that we looked like? I can't remember. I just remember that it was like, yes, the spirit is there. The emotion and so God gives when he gives these visions, he kind of circumvents our conscience. And that's what he says to do. He can circumvent our free will. So we don't we're not just everything he speaks right to the emotion of the heart. So so uh try and remember the emotion which in general is good. Um, but the blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy in Revelation one three. Um, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Because the time is here. May I? There's a. This has a really good. I'm not going to bring it up. This has a really great um, preface to what we're about ready to jump into. Um, so the book of Revelations was written by the Apostle John um, during the exile to the island of Patmos. Uh, John's purpose in writing this book was to give hope and encouragement to those Christians who were suffering severe persecutions for their faith in Jesus Christ. These Christians needed to know that God controls whatever happens on our, here on earth through the imagery. And, and though the imagery and symbols, even the, uh, though they are sometimes difficult uh, to understand, one thing is made clear. Jesus Christ is the Lord and ruler over everyone and everything. Every power, powerful human government he is clearly in control and some uh, someday judge and uh, someday will judge and punish what is evil, uh, even Satan. He will also establish an everlasting covenant uh, kingdom with a new heaven and a new earth. And it goes through much more, but that, that was the only part that's in order to. So, this is going to be some deep stuff, is basically what he's saying, but it was intended for hope and encouragement. Yeah, yeah, and then every, every, Prophecy in the Old Testament ends with an encouraging thing. So let's. So this is, this is post Christ, and we're at in history where we're preaching Christ because He came, and now we're connecting the dots and go, "Whoa, He really was the Son of God. Really, God gave Him charge over everything." And our job as Christians is to continue that message. And in the end of Revelation, we learn that Christ will come back. Um, and the reason I'm skipping the is because I think we're going through some of the things right now. Um, but we're going to talk about the normal way to interpret the tribulation, how I am. I think we're going through the tribulation right now, um, and the different options to, to interpret it. But the, above all, the emotion is hope that Christ will come back. Um, is it correct? So, John, if you hear Revelation uh, one four. Me? That's wait, who is John? No, that's me. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so what's going on here? John seven churches peace to Oh, so this is John 
speaking, not, not yeah. Jesus. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, that or that was the man. So I just did the narrator's part. Yeah. Um, and then here's John. Okay. So John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits for his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be the kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the people of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. So, um, here we have Christ speaking. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Um, says the Lord God. <laughs> who is, who was, and who, who is to come, the Almighty. Let's see. Oh. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Pat Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice of the trumpet that said, write on the scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Pergamum, Tyra, Sard Sardis, Philadelphia, and I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like the son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, and as white as snow, his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze blowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand of the seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining on its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first. Oh, that would be bright. Oh. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw, um, that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And then, uh, so this is, we could, uh, we could do like a round robin paragraph. We treat a little bit. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll start. To the angel in the church in Ephesus. As opposed to Ephesians, which might have the same. Yeah. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men that you have tested those who come to be apostles but are not and have found them false you have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary yeah i hold this against you you have forsaken your first love remember the height from which you have fallen repent and do the things you did at first if you do not repent i will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place 
but if you have this in your but but you have this in your favor, you hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise. Oh, yeah. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these are the words in. Oh, it's actually so good. Uh, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are but are a synagogue of Satan, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Yeah. <clears throat> Got lost. Oh, we're in 12. 12. 12. 2 12. 2 12. A loud voice they say, Worthy is a. Oh, that's what happened. I turned to the wrong page. I got to edit myself something. Yeah. No skipping the head now, buddy. <laughs> At the wind. <laughs> yes. To the angel of the church in Pergamon, right? These are the words of him who has. The sharp double edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Apocalypse. My, faith, my faithful witness, um, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught. Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which are horrible people. <laughs> <laughs> Repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone, a new name written on it. Now, Molly, go ahead and go to see. Right. I'm a little confused about that. Yeah, should we take a break? We just yeah. read a whole bunch. Yeah. But this, uh, I remember the white stone thing, and I don't know. I, I'm not seeing it the right way, way, I guess. I mean, if someone, like it was my birthday or something, or, you know, they give me a white stone with a name on it, I'd be like, you know, what? I have this of any value. <laughs> yeah. And this is showing a new identity. A new identity. Ten on where you have a little Bible study you want to join? Okay, I'll put you on speak. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, so new identity. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I will give you a white stone with a white being purity, mm. uh, with a name written on it, known only to you and him. Okay. And it means the identity that is uh, our identity in Christ that we, to the point where almost we don't even recognize the, the intense identity that Christ sees us mm -hmm. because we see us from our perspective, which is not exactly. Yeah, and we did the Hebrew names, mm -hmm. you know, like um, like in Genesis when we talk about why they named them, they named them a, a certain thing, and it was supposed to be like a blessing throughout their whole life. And oh. the only the only one I remember is Darren. I gave Darren the name Asher because he's like joyful and he's like happy. He's in general happy and the day goes being happy. Generally. Yeah, Asher. <laughs> it hasn't slammed any trees or doors. 
I haven't slammed any doors. Is that what you said? <laughs> I actually ripped that doorknob off. Yeah, it's one of your strong too. I don't know if you're pretty strong, but it's it's like a it's like a blessing. Like he sees the the best way I can experience it or explain it is uh, from Rick Joyner's book. He sees the best in it. He sees the worst in us, playing his day. But he also sees the best that nobody else sees. When we get to heaven, he's going to call us by the best of us. And um, you know, we take on the identity. But, um, yeah, the power. Power. Yeah, and there's so there's also a stone here. Which so why a stone? Give him a white stone with the new name written on it. Um, and I haven't done research on this, but my best guess is that we do this here. We, my friend Gentry, Gentry Dinsmore. Her name is in uh, Pioneer Square, um, and her name is on a brick, and it's part of the building. Saying so she's a part of this community, she's helped build up the people of the community. So going to make her permanently here. So we're, we're going to be part of God's permanent kingdom. Um, it's a plaque. Hidden manna, I don't know. Hidden manna has always been one of the things that I was fascinated by. Mm. Because it's a point where I know that where he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, and higher above whatever, and continue this. He's going to, at that point in time, share with us some of that which we are incapable of knowing now. Yeah, okay, and so manna, so we, we got a bunch of symbols in here. We can, I think we can logically break this down. So manna, um, so here we have dreams with symbols. Uh, um, just like uh, a church is a uh, hey mom we're in revelation uh chapter one and two yes so okay we just this one um but so the church is a lamp is like a lamp um and what does a lamp do it holds fire in place right you can carry it around and take it and the church it was like yeah uh is a city on the hill it's a light but the thing that shines within the church is the spirit of god and the church where we think of church as like a building, and we think of the Spirit of God, like worship's coming, the Spirit's heavy. And in heaven, they view that as, hey, that lamp is burning now with God's Spirit. And we're like, oh, we're, we're actually just a lamp. Okay. Um, but so here we have symbolism. Um, manna is symbolic for the words of God. And in heaven, we're eternally learning about Him. And so some of the secret hidden knowledge could be like, these people are going to learn new things about God before the rest of the people learn about heaven. And it's hidden and it's secret. Um, they learn it first. It's, again, it's emotion is more important. That's a really good thing. Holding fast to the point of the um, And the person did... I think it was Antipas, he was burned at the stake, and he did hold fast to God's name. None of the fire would reach him, and uh, so they got frustrated and they stabbed him, uh, but they missed his heart and hit him in the shoulder and his blood put out the way. Are you talking about again? Uh, Antipas, I believe, I believe Antipas. This guy in the church is being faithful to God's name, and um, he's going to be in heaven with a new name. Yeah, didn't they end up... I thought somebody in Revelation they ended up boiling the fire. I know that that was something that um, Nero was famous for. Oh, yeah. I mean, Nero was famous for lighting them, at, dipping them in tar, and not uh, lighting Christians as torches in his mm -hmm. garden. And he also was known to boil people in oil. Hitler too. They're burning. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, that's, a different thing, that's, that's where we get the term witch hunt. It's usually used in the digest way. Yeah. <laughs> but I gotta use the restroom real quick. Hi, Mom. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying hello on his way to the restroom. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you guys? I'm cold, but good. You're cold? 
we're sitting outside. It's a breeze. I should be cold, but it's just, it's just, oh, it's cold. No, it's cold. So, did you guys have a nice day weather-wise? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Uh, beautiful. Too. I was in fire. <laughs> Breath of the breeze out here, which is unusual. Uh, it's very nice evening. It works. That's the wisdom of the law. I didn't know that. I'm ready to throw it away. That's the wisdom of the law. Right? Just always, really thick paper. It never goes away. I forgot to tell Chris this yet, but um, my dad is coming on Monday night from Mexico. Oh, I'm nice. Pick him up. I'm excited about that. Hi. I don't know how long he's going to be here, but he keeps asking me. <laughs> I always loved in this is the continual use of the number seven. Yeah, which is Please. symbol symbolic for composing. We get that from <clears throat> yeah. Seven days, God rested and completed the creation of the world. Thank you. So, um, I have a whole bunch of weird little questions, I guess, but, uh, what are they? um, so, look, he is coming with the clouds, so we're talking about Jesus is returning, right, with the clouds, he comes from heaven, the heavens are above us, but they're also, there's a spiritual heavens, which are also above us, and on Jacob's ladder, he saw in the spirit angels, coming from essentially the atmosphere from space down to the bottom of the ladder which was the tip of earth and it comes down onto earth and when the spirit comes in churches when leading worship we learn uh, you know it says that the spirit came down from up above to jesus like a dove well, there's, there's something to the, the it's not just that you're in the spiritual world and dimensions don't exist but we get our dimensions because the spirit world has dimensions. The heavens have a, a measurement. You know, the new city of God, we learn, it has an actual, we can measure that. And so the earth is a, um, a lesser form of heaven in essence. And uh, so um, in church, when leading worship, I will feel the spirit's presence and it will be, I feel it kind of almost like the fourth, but I feel it come from above. And I'll, I'll actually watch it with my eyes, even though I see nothing with my eyes, but the church. But I will watch, and just something inside of me, something in the spirit, the spirit comes and it rests on the people like a really softly flowing blanket. No, I feel it. I feel this presence, and, and I know where it's coming from. And the people say that too, you know, like there have been records of people. So they'll, they'll actually see a cloud fill up. God fills with smoke in the sanctuary and comes from above, and they think something's wrong with the heating system. There's so, an old, 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 old worship song that heaven came down and glory filled by a storm, basically. Mm. The descent of it has a lot to do with how worship is performed. As worship is offered, the spirit descends. Mm. Yeah, and it gave me a meaning to that. Uh, I saw the spirit descend on Jesus like a dove. And I finally realized what that meant. They didn't see a physical dove. What they're seeing was the spirit came down and it lands gently on people. So if you think of a way, it says like a dove. It doesn't say it was a dove. So how do you, a, a, 
Yeah, it, it, birds don't, they just don't, dad bomb on there. Flop around and get up. No, they, they flap more as they come in and they go slower, just as our aircraft does. And they really carefully when they get dressed. So that's what I'll see in this bit. That's, that's what that means. It just means gently rest. Um, but anyway, um, so um, they will see Jesus coming on the clouds. So he's coming literally from the sky, and every eye will see him. That one, I'm not sure what that means, because like, how is every eye going to see Jesus coming on the clouds? I see that cloud, but people in China don't see that I realize I might have been in one scene. Um, sort of like in First Corinthians says, we only see in part and know in part, but then what we will see um, completely. And I think there's a point where I can see that literally the whole heaven, heavens open up across the whole world. Mm. And as he's coming down here in the magnificence of the glory that he's coming down, it's going to literally fill every sky. Mm. Oh, that okay. That's a good interpretation. That's better than what I was thinking of like video. Why do you do I guess should, should we continue a little bit more? Um, now, does anybody have any history on the knowledge on the Nicolaitan? Uh, yeah, they were uh, vile people. Mm. They they believed in human sacrifice. They believed in um, like the sacrifice. Uh, that they they believed in like uh, the prostitution as a form of worship. Yeah, temple prostitutes. Yeah, that's it. And it's something in there. They also, huh? No. Um, they also was a point where I mean, they were more polytheist than anything else, mm -hmm. and uh, the worship of other gods obviously makes the Lord a little ticked off. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. What was that word you used? Polytheist. Polytheist. Um, polytheist. Monotheist believe in one God. Polytheists, like you know, a lot of Hindus, are polytheists. They believe in all gods. And everything, and they'll believe in this God, and mean they'll believe in. But and poly means many, mm -hmm. and mono means one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well. Yeah. Where do we leave off? Thyrotyra. So, verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am He who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay, and, uh, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end. I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the, 
to the churches. Lucifer. There was Lucifer was called the the star of the morning. When oh, he, when yeah. He went, when he was a worshiping cherub. Yeah. yeah okay, so let's, let's read that again. Um, what is that? 28. Verse 28. 28. I'll also give him the morning star. I think that's a position more than anything else. Yeah. I um, can't remember what stars represent. Um... Who is, who is him? And that sentence, I will also give him. That's Christ talking. To him who overcomes, I will give him Satan. No, to, to him, okay, to him who overcomes, that's the, the followers and the retire on. Yeah. So, and another thing, these churches are uh, big city churches. They're all in Turkey. The country of Turkey, and they're all big cities. So, you could easily say, to the church, to the angel in the church of New York, to the angel in the church of Boston, to the angel in the church of Portland. What about Salem? But basically, it's, uh, um, there were hot spots in the world, in the Middle East. Um, Jews, I think, were being exiled that way. Um, but basically, it applies to every church in that we are all. To hold fast to Christ, and so basically saying to us, too, I take I take all of these persons. I think everything in the Bible person. <laughs> That's <laughs> actually a safe thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so where are we at? Three. Do we want to keep going? You got two youngs. Um, <laughs> I think you'll. That was not on purpose. Um, <laughs> third and fourth chapter basically are the completion of the of the letters, and then it digs into that. The difficult stuff. To understand. Then it starts into the imagery. Okay. Yeah. So we'll go um, three on, and I think you have press <laughs> yep. imagery. To the angel of the church of Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. There we go. Um, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're really dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and what is um, and, and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know uh, at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out their name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? These are the word of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have kept little that you have little strength, that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. 
I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The angel of the church in Laodicea. Laodicea, right? These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now we can Yeah, let's let's do these uh two weeks. Unless Raquel wants to lead next week. Um is that it? is that Part, is another part of the Bible also? The knock and enter? Is that another part too? Or is it just in Revelation? Yeah, let's look that up. So if you're going to stand at the door and knock, um, 20. So that will be Sermon on the Mount. Let's see if there's a cross reference to 20. 320, Matthew 24, 33. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought I'm seeing my class. I didn't remember my Revelation. <laughs> yeah, did you I want to look the pictures. Yeah literal artist renditions of Christ standing outside of a door yeah, uh, knocking on it. Do you want to look up the passage? Yeah, okay. Twenty-four thirty-three. 34, 33. Mm -hmm. the, end of, the end of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. So this is signs of the end of the age that we are talking about the end of the age. <laughs> now, of course, it's there. Um, oh. Oh, not what I meant. No, yeah, <laughs> but uh, it says that um, at the time of the Son of Man will appear in the skies, Jesus speaking again, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. Again, that was the question I had. Why are people warning? Um, I think they're suddenly revealing that they. Oops. Yeah. I didn't know this was true. I just uh -oh. thought it was a myth. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They were <laughs> on the cloud. Yeah, that makes sense because because uh, he's light. We're in all, you know, everyone's living in darkness. So when he. To see him. You know, you see all your flaws and you're like, crap. It's time to hide. shows it up and everything, so. Yeah, and that makes sense, too. Like, who doesn't mourn over their sin? Um, well, those who don't acknowledge their sin, um, so they'll mourn because their judgment is coming. And then those who do will mourn because, no, I thought it'd be joyous, but. I think there's something, even those who have pierced him, it's going to say, that's way back. But I said also the point where any time we sin, we put Christ to the, uh, on the cross again. Mm. And Yeah, and for the vibe I get from that is like, that's a literally, like, those are the people, the Assyrians who were used, hired by the Romans to do their dirty work. Mm -hmm. Oh, bowls of Bashan, strong bowls of Bashan encircle me. Um, those guys, like the physical guys, they will see. But so everybody's seeing Jesus, everybody's mourning. People in the grave. Yeah. 
people in hell will see me as returning you from heaven. Hmm. Okay. It seems to me that it's very, very possible for an omnipotent God to make it clean beyond time, to, uh, time space, and dimension. Yeah, none of that stuff matters <laughs> to him. Yeah, and he's key. Well, he, outside it, of time. It does does matter to him. Yeah, he's outside of it. But so he's, yeah, in authority. To, to us, it, we can't comprehend it, but that's just the way it is. So I, I found it interesting that he says that uh, lukewarm is worse than hot or cold. Yeah. To me, that's kind of shocking, you know. I thought, like, someone who's cold <laughs> would be worse, worse than but than someone that's lukewarm, you can well, spit it out of the thing about it, too, is uh, what I see is so badly is the fact that a cold person, you know they're not trying to be godly whatsoever, and they're not making any qualms about it. Um, so, and, but, uh, and a lot of times they're admittedly so. They go, I'm not right with the Lord, and I know it. I've been cold to the Lord. And but there's a point. Back. I mean, the lukewarm are just going through the motions and they're they're going to the church they're going they're doing their sundays they're reading reading words out of their bible in the morning or in the day and they're doing their god bless the food and god bless uh, the world and bring peace and they're going through the motions and they absolutely have no heart invested in it they're doing what they know they're supposed to do out of obligation to be if I'm supposed to, if I'm to be blessed by God, I have to do all these things, and it's a performance. It is not the heart turning to relationship to God. And because of that, people can see the performance mentality, and there are thousands of people who will go to a service because you're supposed to go to church, you're supposed to give, you're supposed to do this, you're supposed, and it's all the, they're seeing about performance. They're not doing, they're not seeing the fact that we do this out of Mm -hmm. Out of uh, out being, it compels us to do it because of the love of God in us. That's mm -hmm. why we will do it, and we're obeying and various different things because of what God sparks in us. But when you are at a point of just going through the motions, then you tend, people tend to think that's all you really need to do, and it's more of a disease that will spread instead of being seen. There, I mean, instead of being the light. We are kind of just foggy gray, and people think that's all you need to do to be Christians. And yeah. that's a point where I see that being more deadly than whether you're being so absolutely cold or you're being a light. And I, and I wonder if it's also in reference. Oh, Mom, were you going to say something? No, I'm just agreeing. Hmm. And, uh, I think it's also in reference to the anger that he feels towards them and why he thinks that it's better to be lukewarm is that a lot of times lukewarmness spreads. You'd be like, look what God did in my life. And people are like, yeah, okay, that's cool, you know. Let me get back to what I was doing. And that can, over time, that can bog you down. And especially in ministry where you're not getting paid a lot and Satan's always against you and you just want, somebody to relate to, you know, about this one thing. So you go talk to people and they're like, yeah, that's cool. You know, that's a core. That lukewarmness spreads and it kind of kills your fire and your passion. And I think I've ran into that more than anything else in the Church of America. Just absolute lukewarmness. And it drives me nuts. I'd rather have people be walking away from church so I can go, hey, you need to get back into church. A lot of times those people are like, you're right. You know, you need to keep worshiping God. You need to go forward. A lot of times those people are more honest, but it's a lot harder when people are, are just kind of shoving away every good thing that's happening to you that you're sharing to them. And they're like, yeah, okay, that's okay. It's, it cuts the heart of me, and it cuts me down, and it, over time it, it, it hurts. And so you have to keep a fire to minister to people. You have to continually be passionate about God. And when you're continually surrounded about people who are not passionate about God and you've given out that passion and you're emotionally tired and you're looking for somebody to be passionate to, to refill your cup and you don't get that, that's extremely frustrating. And that is ministry burnout. And that is probably where the anger is coming from. You know, God's saying, I've sent you these people to get you passionate about me 
and they're being turned down left and right. I'd rather you be outside of my church so I can pull you back in than to be inside and making you bog down mm -hmm. words. You can literally, you can actually have better conversations with somebody who's f-bombing every thirty seconds because they and they don't are show no interest whatsoever because at least you can They're you can uh, yeah, honesty yeah you can you can you can express God and you can express you can uh, show difference between light and darkness I mean we'll actually will it's easier to do that rather than somebody who is like milk toast and you won't bud yeah oh why do i need to do that i'm already doing this i'm already doing that i you know, i'm good enough i i don't i don't kick dogs and i don't kick puppies and i i mean i'm a good person and that's all and they really think that's all they really need to be and i mean a lot of the uh, a lot of different faiths believe that um it's measured on your good works versus your bad works which again is all performance, um, but again, it, I mean, it's a point where they're so they literally will sap the living life out of you because they're it's just like day old oatmeal. <laughs> I mean, it just what they can't they don't care, and they think that they're good enough. They don't think that they need anything because they think I'm doing everything I should probably do as a good moral person. Yeah. And, and so in that reason, I think maybe that that person's lukewarm people's hearts are further away from God than somebody who's uh, cold and against God, but with a little bit of correction, they'll be right away. Oh, man, what was I thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, I've had lots of friends that way. Did that help there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 15 minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, don't be lukewarm. Uh, and and the, way, the way we cannot be lukewarm, because it's so easy to be lukewarm, and be like, yeah, okay, I guess. The way is to, win, uh, to study on your own, to worship God on your own, to dig deep about what, what is at the root of my heart that is causing me, is blocking me in growth with God. And it has more to do with honesty. And uh, um, Joel Houston said, God doesn't want more from us. He wants more of us. Which means that he may not necessarily want us to quit our jobs and go and live in poor in India. Um, a lot of times, he wants us to share our bad day at work with him and to be open and emotionally honest with him. And to continually pursue God um, through that lukewarmness, it shows God that we're being responsible with him and what we have, and that will in turn, um, he can use us more for his good. Should we pray and close? I don't see any comments. Um, well, <sighs> Those are car ones, aren't they? I think those are people. Oh, wait. Maybe. People joining. <laughs> Is Chris watching? You better be that lukewarm monkey. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> you for a bunny. He probably heard that. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't tell him. <laughs> God, I, uh, I thank you for you. Um, and thank you for being uh, passionate when we sometimes are dry, um, for being uh, always on fire. Um, it says that your eyes are a blazing fire, and just like in the book of Daniel, you're, you're always burning. And even when we aren't passionate about you, God, and even um, when I'm not passionate about you, God, you're still, you're still burning in your heart after all of us. And thank you for your love and your desire to pursue us, that you would come down once, get crucified, come back to heaven, have us prove your authority on earth, and then come down again uh, to make things right, God. And, and we thank you for um, being here and for your word and doing that. And we pray that you that please be with us throughout the week. Keep our passion for you strong and keep us in your word and in your worship. And keep us warm. Thank you for this life. Um, and please bless everyone here. May we uh, just stay in your word.
Thanks for joining, Mom. Yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, was in the front room and Bruce said, Did you have Bible study? And I, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my ring.